Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. We're so glad that you're here today. Are you glad to be here? Well, at least three or four of you were. We're getting better. I think it was two last week. Are you glad to be here today? Say amen. amen. Repeat after me. I was glad. When they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Join in standing with me if you would please and let's sing together. I will call upon the Lord. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm so glad you're here. Brother Gary, are you glad everybody's here today? Amen. Absolutely. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, boy, I'm glad you're here. Just do it right now. Now, in addition to that, I want you to look around and find someone, maybe you don't know them, uh, just in a moment when we stand, go find them, introduce yourself, welcome them, and... and uh, so, Amy's still married, right? And they said it wouldn't last. Yeah, no, nah, that's wonderful. We're congratulations to uh, Amy Sultemeyer, our intern, last several years. They got married a week ago, and we're happy. They're on honeymoon and joined themselves. Where'd they go? They went to Disney World. What a good time that is for young people. But listen, as our ushers are making their way forward, we want to just say a, a quick word of greeting to our guest. Inside our worship guide, there's that little tear-off sheet right there. That's called the connection card. We have a gift for you. It's a ballpoint pen. It's, we want you, if you're a guest, just kind of wave at the men as they're heading back. And uh, just uh, use the pen, fill out the connection card, put it in the offering plate uh, down towards the end of the, uh, is it? in the middle of the service today, and uh, we'd love to contact you this week. We're honored by your presence. We're glad that every member is here. A lot of folks out of town right now. 
A lot of folks, our youth, are going to Super Summer uh, this week. Uh, some are already up there. Be much in prayer for them. And as the other summer activities, lots of things coming up. Yeah, be much in prayer and be ready and willing to help best you can. Again, guests and members alike, honored that you're here. Glad you're here. Uh, children, Miss Catherine's got some goodies up here. I'm going to children's sermon today. Is that okay, Catherine? Okay, good. It's, uh, it's a good deal up here. So kids, you come down. Find somebody you don't know. Greet them in the name of the Lord. One child say good morning. <laughs> and two big kids sitting up here, too. Did you see that? Um, how many of you have ever seen something cool done and wanted to learn how to do it yourself? Huh? How about skydiving? Who wants to learn how to skydive? Raise your hand up here. I could teach you. I got some no's. I've never been. Can I teach you? You're all right with that? Ask your mom if she's all right with that. <laughs> That's right. I've never done it. So would I be a good teacher for that? No. I don't think I could. You couldn't push me out anyway. I'd go down with the plane because I'm not interested in that, and it would scare me. Um, since I can't teach you, there are other things that I could teach you. And guess what? Jesus taught his disciples. They saw him do different things. Do you think they asked him if, if he could teach them to walk on water? I don't think they asked. They just recognized that he could do it, and they wanted to learn from him. One of the things that the disciples asked Jesus was, teach me how to pray. And that's really what Brother Don's going to talk about, not only today, but in the weeks to come. How do we pray? Does anybody here know how you start? How? You fold your hands, close your eyes, and then... Say something to God that you are thankful for, or something like that. Does he already know what you're going to say? Hmm? How does he know? Because he knows everything. Ah, oh, that's right. He knows everything. But that's right. But we should talk to him anyway, like he's our best friend. When we believe in him, we go to him, not only with thanksgiving, but in all of the things that we just want to talk about with our best friend. It'd be like picking up the cell phone and talking to him. So when the disciples asked Jesus, how do we pray? Jesus had some great tips. We're going to listen not only today, but in the next couple of weeks to learn about what he told them. All right? Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you sent your son to teach us so that we can pray, that we can come to you, not only in hours of need, but all day long, every day. 
And Lord, we're thankful to live in a place where we can do that. We can drop to our knees at any moment. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for guiding us and teaching us. And thank you for your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Miss Catherine.
the things he has done and the things he's doing and the things he will do. We live in a turbulent time, a time when you just, uh, all you have to do is turn the news on and see what's happening all across our country, all across our world. And uh, uh, things are being shaken up. But when we're in Christ, we don't have to be shaken. Our security, our faith, our trust is in him. And he is with us every step of the way. We'd like to share with you a song entitled, I Will Not Be Shaken.
My prayer life is alive. It's vibrant. It's daily. I like to pray at nighttime. I like to get into bed and I kiss my wife goodnight, pull the covers up, and then it's just me and God. And I'm just praying. <sighs> Makes me sleepy just thinking about it. <laughs> I just lay out my request to God. <sighs> and I'm praying. And he's listening. And I'm listening. And he's praying. Where was I? God and I don't talk like we should. I mean, it's not his fault. It's mine. I'm just so busy. But when I do pray to God, I, I like to impress him. And show him a good show, if you know what I mean, and others around me, <laughs> of how much I really love him. Here, let me give you a little taste. Oh, great God in heaven above, please, oh Lord, I beg thee, do not beseech me unto thee. How now, brown cow, <laughs> my soul is so longing for nourishment. Oh, dear Father, if I but have a morsel of who you are, verily, merrily down the stream. <laughs> Amen. <sighs> oh, God, I just want to be useful to you. Oh, I just want to be salt and light. Light and salt. Salt and pepper. <laughs> salt and pepperoni. And sausage and extra cheese and those, those little black things I like. When I get my prayer on, I like to do a few things. And so, I think it's just awesome how God is like Santa Claus and gives us what we want whenever we ask him. And so I have found a few tips that maybe you would be able to glean some wisdom from in the fact that I make lists. So this is my prayer list, and on my prayer list I've got um, 791 things that I like to go to the Father with, and um, sometimes it just makes it a little bit easier for me. If I can just, you know, go down the list and pray for all 791 things. So I'm going to give you a little foretaste of what that looks like right now. Let's see here. Um, first thing on my list is my mom. Okay, so I'm going to pray for my mom right now. Boy, I just want to pray for this sweet woman who gave me life. She's so special to me. And Lord, if I can ask for anything for my mother, could you just get her off my back, please? <laughs> Could you just tell her that I'll get married when I want to get married and she can't make that happen? Lord, if you could just mute her for one day with your supersized God and mute button, that would be just great. Nothing permanent, just a little mute. Okay, and then uh, number two. I got I have a car, it's a pacer. And um, though it's a really nice car, uh, it's, um, it's kind of, it's not my style. And so, if you could just, I don't know, maybe, you know, um, a Lamborghini would be nice. Uh, so, if you could just do your little God thing with your little God next one thing, that'd be really, really good. You know what, God, this is going to take me a while, and i got things to do, and you're probably a speed reader. So, I'm just going to, um, <laughs> you know what, it, it might save a whole lot more time if I just leave it right here. So. You look at it, take your time, don't feel like you got to rush or anything, but, um, amen. <laughs> God, you created the earth and the, the sky and the sea and the stars and the planets and all the animals and all the people. You are so amazing. I ask for, your, for you to be present here, God, to bring your amazingness down, to, 
my home and my family, to my church, to my job, to, to the government, to this nation, and to the world. Thank you for my job. God, that promotion came just at the most needed time for me and my family. You're such a faithful provider. I'm sorry, God, that I've doubted you all those times. These past several months have been really hard, and, well, it's just so easy to blame you. Thank you for your forgiveness. And thanks for helping me to uh, not hold a grudge against others especially my neighbor. I guess forgiveness is just another one of those things that you're teaching me about. <clears throat> and Lord, keep me out of those sticky situations. I know they'll never turn out any good for me or for my family. Just keep me safe and walking in you. I don't want anything else. <clears throat> in you, God, I'm safe and secure. I know that I don't have to worry about anything or be fearful of anything. God, you are always so amazing. Thank you. Amen. Amen. And all the people said, if you'll find the, your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 6, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. And if you'd also find your worship guide, we're going to use the Lord's Prayer as it is um, printed on the front of the page in unison in a moment. So if you found Matthew chapter 6, uh, beginning with verse 5, and your worship guide, would you please stand? <clears throat> and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray, in unison, please. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, hear our prayer. Bless us in this time of worship. Help us to take time to be holy in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you be seated, please? Take time to be
Our Father, which art in heaven, we come now to this portion of our service. We pray that you'll bless the tithes and offering and give us the wisdom to use them to further thy cause here in this community and throughout the world. We thank you for them. Through Christ I pray. Amen.
Again, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to find the Gospel of Matthew. And um, we're beginning this summer, the, the weeks, a series of sermons based on prayer, on the Lord's Prayer. In Luke chapter 11, the disciples, we find out, have listened to Jesus pray. And they turn to Jesus and say, Lord, teach us to pray, like John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. And, and, and you know, I thought about that. You know, someone had to teach us to pray, didn't we? You, I, I'm not sure if it's something that is uh, in, inherent in our lives, just innate, the, the ability to cry out to God. I think there is some truth to that. But if it's a, a table prayer that, that maybe you learned uh, as a child to speak before, kind of like uh, over the lips and over the gums, look out, tummy, here it comes, something like that, but maybe a little more spiritual than that. Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Many of you learned that prayer. And undoubtedly, there was some time in your life, mine, it was in Sunday school, where I was challenged to memorize the Lord's Prayer. Now, the Lord's Prayer is a wonderful aspect of worship. To stand and recite it together is, is a wonderful thing. But it's not really the Lord's Prayer. You find that in John 17. This is the model prayer. And if the only use we ever use of the model prayer is to, in unison, trespasses, debts, whatever, whatever uh, format we use, We'll miss the point of the Lord's Prayer. For in the Lord's Prayer, this model prayer, there is an incredible amount of truth. Now, today the message is principles. Did I just lose my, uh, I, just, I just lost my monitor. I need a little more sound. I'm not sure what happened to it. Just a little more sound up here, Nathan, if you would. Uh, if we only use it as a, a, a something to recite, we miss the point that Jesus is teaching us principles about prayer. And here in Matthew 5, in the context of, of acts of righteousness that include the giving of alms and prayer and, and, and other acts of ministry and worship we'll see in this beautiful Sermon on the Mount, that there is much teaching to help us understand what and how we can improve in our prayer life. Now, Principles of prayer, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to be able to give them all to you today. Some of you are probably thinking, well, you missed this principle, you forgot that one. No, well, maybe I did, but give me the summer to try to take us into understanding the rich opportunity that is ours as we say to God, as the disciples long ago and disciples even till today, Lord, teach us to pray. To pray more effectively, we find in this beautiful passage that we are called to avoid the potential perversions of prayer. You, you find the outline in the back of your worship guide. Lots of scriptures there for you to pursue and take home and read, but God calls us to avoid potential perversions. When, when you pray, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't, don't, when you pray, don't allow yourself to go on and on in, in words. There are perversions that can come into our lives. And after Solomon's temple was destroyed and, and, and it just seems as though prayer began to replace the offering of sacrifices, that prayer, especially when Herod's temple was destroyed and the sacrificial system went away. The prayers completely replaced the sacrificial system. And just as we know there can be perversions in the offering of sacrifices, there can be perversions in our offering of prayer. The Talmud gave um, very careful and, and uh, uh, accurate descriptions of prayer. And there were religious people who took that and, and just kind of ran with it. And, and sometimes, like the people back then, where prayer became more of, Trish, your public demonstration of uh, verbal ability rather than a heart-to-heart -heart 
conversation with God, prayer can become perverted. Well, let, me, let me mention a couple, three, three perversions today. Your, your prayer life can become perverted when you just don't pray. This ought to be a challenge for us. Prayer in a Christian's life and heart can be perverted, obviously, significantly when we just don't pray. When we don't take the time to be holy, we don't, don't take the time to be with God. Three times in this text, the use of the subjunctive, when you pray, when you pray, when you pray, it ought to at least be an understanding from our, from our perspective, at least an assumption that God expects us to pray. And then in verse 9, he says, pray in this manner, aorist imperative. For us to fail to pray is the ultimate perversion of prayer in our life. For Samuel, chapter 12, verse 23 says, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. I, I, I believe in, in my own life, an area that I'm really convicted and challenged to consider, hence the, the messages this summer. I think it is a significant challenge for all of us to understand that the devil will do anything and everything to keep you from praying. He'll make you so busy in religious activity if it somehow will keep you from praying to God. The ultimate perversion in the Christian's life of prayer is prayerlessness. I think most people today would agree it is the reason for the lack of power within the body of Christ, for the lack of faithfulness by Christians today, for the obvious lack of fruitfulness in our life, and most importantly, the lack of unity in the church today. James 4.2 says it simply, you have not because you ask not. We've got to avoid potential perversions of our prayer life. If we're going to have principles of prayer and be effective in our discipleship and our walk with Christ, we can pervert prayer with prayerlessness. And also, let me suggest today, with meaningless repetitions. It's interesting in, in, in the passage here in verse 5, and when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues. And, and then in verse 6, but when you pray, go to your room. Then in verse 7, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling. The, the, the phrase there, the strategy there is a, subju is a subjunctive mood with, with a particular word that says, don't ever start babbling in your prayers. You, you see, sometimes we memorize catchphrases. You see it and hear it in sermons sometimes from folks, but you see it and hear it in prayer that you're going to have the same kind of wording and you just kind <clears> of <throat> assault, assault the throne of heaven with repetition over and over again. It's true in music. If we're not careful, sometimes we can be uh, so repetitious in music, we miss the, the point of it. And, 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 and we just think that somehow by singing another verse or two or 10 or 11 that somehow God's going to be blessed. We can do it in Scripture. Have you ever heard someone God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, who served, believed in him, should not perish, should have his own life. Now, one of, the, one of the risks of scripture memory, and we really focus on that, is that sometimes we encourage the kids to learn scripture, and they blow through it so quickly that you wonder if there's ever a stop to wonder, what does it mean for God so loved the world? Am I making sense here? And in our prayer life, if we think that somehow God is impressed with lots and lots of words that we understand that we're missing the point. Scott is trustworthy, law, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, very clean and reverent. Get the Scott law out there. Same kind of idea. We can pervert our prayer with prayerlessness. We can pervert our prayer life when we use meaningless repetition on and on. 
And we can pervert our prayer life with hypocrisy. Verse 5 says it pretty clearly. And when you pray, don't ever be, same construction, hypocritical with your prayers. I I wish we were in a classroom right now. I'd stop, and and I'm going to stop right now. I'm going to give you a second here. I want you to think in your mind, what does it mean to be hypocritical in prayer? I'm not really going to ask for you to respond to me right now. I guess if you'd like to, go ahead. (laughs) But think about it before I suggest a couple of ideas. What would it mean to you when he says, and don't be like the hypocrites? Well, you know, their, their focus was on standing on the street corner and focusing their energy so much on prayer in such a way that the people who would come by would just go, wow. And sometimes when you focus on getting the wow from other people, you know what you're missing? Listen to verse 5. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. I tell you the truth, they have their reward in full. So if you ever find yourself in the midst of a prayer, praying in such a way you're trying to impress others, than talking to God. Your prayers have become hypocritical. The mask that is covered to the face when our words don't match the heart. Then perhaps our prayers have become hypocritical. I, I, there's an old expression, and I want to put an acrostic up on the deal. There was a, you may have heard this before. A, a guy was preaching at Yale for chapel. And he used the, the word yell, Y-A-L-E. Ken, can you find that up there? Put it on the screen. And for 20 minutes, he, he just lambasted the youth of the day. For 20 minutes, he talked about their ambition and how wrong it was. And, and for their lust and love, 20 more minutes. And then for 20, 80-minute chapel, just, just hammering them. And when the invitation was given, a man came and he was weeping uncontrollably and the chapel speaker was a little puffed up and he he went up to him and said what did I say that moved you so much and he said oh I, I just want you to see I want you to understand I'm so thankful that I had not attended the Massachusetts Institute of Technology think about that for a minute you don't have to pray that way God speaks to our heart not needing long prayers, not needing prayers that are somehow written in such a way to impress others, but prayers that avoid the potential perversion and go straight to the heart of communicating with God. Now, to help you with that, I want to challenge you not only to avoid the the, the perversions, but to assign a particular place. Find a place in your life, in your home, where you can say, this is my place of prayer. Look at verse 6. And when you pray, go into your room, aorist imperative, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees you as what is done in secret, will reward you. The bulk of our prayer Somehow in our life, we need to understand that God desires for us to be alone with the Father. And the best way, I think, the best way we can accomplish this is not to just do it when we can happenstancely find a place, but to set aside a particular place. It might be a room, a closet, a storage room. It could be your couch. Just anywhere but a place that you said, this is where primarily I'm going to meet with the Father. I would say most of us, maybe we don't have that place. And prayer is more happenstance rather than assigning a particular place. Now, there's nothing wrong with public prayer. But I think as you see, and since verse 6, it is saying the bulk of our prayer needs to be done in secret. Now, Abraham went to the place where he stood before the Lord, went to the place where he stood before the Lord. Peter prayed on the top of a housetop over there in Acts. 
Daniel went to his chamber. Jesus went to the mountaintop, to a lonely place, and to the Garden of Gethsemane, which I believe was his specific assigned place for prayer whenever he was in Jerusalem or that area. That's why Judas knew where to find him. Where do you take a shower? Where do you eat supper? Where do you park your car? Where do you read the paper? Where do you get dressed? You know, all of these places have an assigned place. And I want to challenge each and every one of us to think it that there would be a place at home, maybe at work, where you can step aside and there you know the assignment is to visit with the Almighty. Second place would be here at church. Down the hallway, about halfway to the office, on the left there, there is a prayer room. Deborah Hinky is our coordinator of that, where you can sign up. But even if you're not signed up, if it's open and vacant, you are welcome to come and there to go in secret to intercede and to ask of the Lord. I believe we'll be more effective in prayer if we can avoid the perversions, whatever they may be. And if we can assign the place and then appoint a protected period. It's one thing to have a place, but you've got to decide when are you going to do it. You know, there are, there are things that we do with great regularity and, and we assign a time, a, a, a period for that. Well, prayer is no different. We ought to have not only the place, but the period, the time of it. Daniel, in Daniel 6.10, we understand he prayed three times. He prayed it, uh, probably associated with the times of sacrifice in the third, sixth, and ninth hour. He prayed at 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m. In, in, in an English kind of time. But he set aside a regular place in his chamber and a regular time, 3, 6, and 9. You know, we drink Dr. Pepper at 10, 2, and 4, don't we? We ought to pray. Now, I don't know if you ought to pray at 3, 6, 9. Maybe in the morning. Maybe in the evening and regularly, ongoing in between. But the point is, if you don't have a protected period, you can get up in the morning and rush to work and all of a sudden you get to bed like Han was trying to show us and you're trying to talk to the Lord and you fall asleep while you apologize for how you messed up the day. Jesus prayed all night long on many occasions. He asked the disciples, could you not wait with me one hour? We sing sweet hour of prayer, but sometimes I wonder, have we ever, have I ever gone all through the night to pray? It is a challenge to pray for an hour, but I'm convinced that people who are truly committed, but when you pray, pray in this manner, when they understand an hour will go like that when you are visiting with the heavenly Father. I think we ought to pray in the morning as much as any time. Psalm 88, 13 says, But I, O Lord, have cried out to you for help, and in the morning my prayer comes before you. We ought to start the day with prayer, a protected place, a protected period, where we go to that very specific place and to say, Here is my day, God. This is what i got to do. i got to mess with Brother Gary in staff meeting. i got to visit with Brother... You know how tough that is, right? But to bring your day before God, laying it out rather than waiting to the end of the day when maybe we apologize for the mess we made of it. History teaches us that the great heroes of the faith, biblically and ever since then, were men and women of great prayers who somehow avoided the perversions and they had the place and they had the period and they moved on to pray without ceasing, whenever and however, wherever they were. You, you know, do you ever have an appointment? Do you, do you have an appointment with like a dentist or a doctor? How about a barber or a hairstylist? Anybody here ever have a tea time in golf? You know, if we can get a tea time, maybe we need to have some knee time. Amen. Avoid the perversions. Assign the place. 
Protect the period. And then, let me suggest a couple more things, I'll be done. Ally yourself with proper participants. As significant and important prayer is, it is something that must be done alone, but also must be done with companions. The bulk of our prayer, Matthew 6, pray in secret. But yet, we are also pray, encouraged to pray in pairs. You, you know, the Bible says, if two of you agree on earth about anything that you may ask, it will be done. When you consider the Lord's Prayer, we'll be doing this in a few weeks. When Jesus taught us to pray, pray this way, our Father who art in heaven, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us. That's plural. Sometimes we are to come together with a prayer partner, somebody that we can trust and say, listen, I need to pray. And when Trish was praying about that Lamborghini, now that came close to home because most of you know, my little car got all beat up in the hailstorm. It was total. And for the last two, two and a half weeks, I was praying, God, what do I need? And, and, and you know, I was thinking about Magnum PI, red car. You know, I was thinking that, that would be good. Maybe a Royals Ro Royce so Gary and I can drive around Fredericksburg. And, and you know, the voice said, no, Brother Don, you don't need that. But you know, if I'd have had a prayer partner to say, you gotta be kidding. That's what prayer partners do. They help us to keep grounded. Even though we can maybe let our prayers run in a spiritual way. Oh, Lord, that Lamborghini, my goodness, or that Porsche, or whatever. That'd be really fantastic. But maybe God would want to say, you know, just get something that'll get you from point A to point B. So you can do the ministry that God has called. You don't need to spend $300,000 on a car. That was really my wife's voice saying that, you know, but I, <laughs> you pray it alone. You pray in pairs. I think it's good to pray in small groups where two or three are gathered in my name. I'm going to be there with you. And there's just something about praying together with people that you love and trust that somehow helps prayers to become more and better focused. And public prayers, absolutely, are always the prayer of a righteous man. It, 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 it edifies and, and, and builds up. Not the long, flowery, babbling kind, just the heartfelt prayers of men and women who love the Lord. I was a little bitty guy. Man, I was young. I, I, I can hardly remember this. Seven, eight, something like that. And I got a job delivering flyers door to door. Anybody ever do that? It was great. I mean, I, I set a few flyers on the doors and they paid me. I thought that was cool. So the guy dropped me off at a really long street all by myself. And I'm looking down that street thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to be here all day. And I began to drop off those flyers, and then he dropped off another young man over here. And then I could see way down the street, there was another guy there and another guy there. And we began to distribute those flyers. Some of it's got to be done by ourselves. Some of it in couples, some of it in pairs, some of it in groups. And even the whole body of Christ, as we come together, creating a synergy of, of coming before God to discern the will of the Lord. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For prayers to, our prayer life to improve, we've got to avoid the perversion. Absolutely, all that they may be. We've got to find that place. We've got to find that period. We've got to line up with some participants. And then, really quickly, just find the proper position, the perfect position. Sometimes, we pray standing. Sometimes we pray kneeling. Sometimes it's bowing prostrate, uh, prostrate before God. There's, uh, sometimes our heart just dictates a prayer of praise and ad adoration or a prayer of heartfelt great need falling on our face. It, it really doesn't matter. The man fell off uh, the cliff one day and as he was falling down to his death, he grabbed a hold of a bush and he's crying out to God, God, save me, help me. And the voice from heaven said, my son, let go, trust me. And he hung there for a minute and he said, is there anybody else up there? You know, sometimes we do our best praying when we're hanging onto a bush on the side of a cliff. 
But regardless of the position, the kneeling of the heart, surrendering and submitting to God is absolutely essential. Thomas Adams, a Puritan preacher of long ago, said this, God is the Lord of both body and spirit. He challenges both my reverent gesture as well as my inward devotion. I will ever in my prayers either stand as his servant or kneel in subjection to my Lord. Never tell me of an humble heart where I see a stubborn knee. This is a marvelous text. And when you pray, don't ever pray like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when we pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen, that your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, never ever babble on like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Stop being like them, for your Father knows what you need. Avoid the perversions. Assign the place, appoint the period, get you some support, and then assume the position of bowing the knee of your heart. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would guide us this summer. Challenge us even today in our hearts to not just talk about it, but to actually pray. Forgive us for the sin of prayerlessness and for all the sin that hinders our prayer life. Speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Would you stand as we sing today The altar is here open for you to come and to kneel and pray. To come and if a decision is required, it's public, you come. I'll visit with you, pray with you as we sing. Jesus is Savior and Lord of my life. My hope, my glory, my hope. Wonderful Master. Would you bow your heads? Brother Gary, just sing that second verse for us. Just talk to the Lord. Let's sing together. Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus is Lord of all. Lord of my thoughts and my service each day. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, If you'll just uh, look at the bulletin, a couple things. 
Uh, next Saturday, uh, First Baptist Church is sponsoring a, a morning activity, a, a, a leadership seminar. Uh, Dr. Randy Marshall, uh, one of my dear friends, is, uh, uh, just was named the, the Deputy Command Chaplain of the United States Air Force Reserve. And uh, we're going to Atlanta to Warner Robins, I think is the place where his offices will be. Randy's going to come and talk to us about leadership principles and concepts within the church. If you're a committee chair, a leader of a ministry, Sunday school teacher, a Sunday school president of a class, something like that, or if you're just interested in thinking, what does a Christian leader look like and act like? You'll be invited. 8.30, we'll have a little light breakfast, and at 9 o'clock, we'll be through by 12. Now, I don't do a lot of stuff on Saturdays. I just, I understand what it's like to be a working person. And sometimes Saturday is the time you have to make hay. And so, uh, but this is something, it's a kind of the only opportunity we have. And I'd love for you to be a part. Any, any and all are invited. Just call the office, let us know. That way, Brother Gary, get enough donuts for he and I and for you as well, okay? Uh, we'd love for you to be a part of that. And you see the other opportunities uh, in, in weeks to come. Uh, the uh, Ministry of 68, the Fellowship of Eight or something like that is the time this summer for folks just to get together, kind of a very, uh, no real big plan or structure or strategy, just to get together, share with one another. I'd love for you to have a group. I'd love to help you find a group. So give me a call and we'll do our best just to bless and improve the fellowship within our church. Brother Gary, any other announcements? Uh, next Sunday, Father's Day, we're going to have an all-men's choir. We want you men to come and join us. We'll meet in here at 1015 to rehearse and practice and would love for you to be a part of that. Real, real men sing in the men's choir. Brother Gary, you know that, don't you? Real men. Real men. So I'll let you decide. God bless you. Hope you have a great day. Uh, and I, my prayer is, is that we will learn more and more about prayer. God bless you. Brother Gary, send us to lunch. To God be the glory. Let's sing it as we go. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. For the things he has done with his blood he has saved. With his power, he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things he has done. May the Lord bless you. Have a great week.